And the first role that we'll see for the phosphate group itself is as nature's nucleophage, nature's leaving group. The phosphate, diphosphate, and triphosphate anions are relatively stable, especially when metal cations like Mg2 plus are around. And for this reason, they can act as leaving groups. The typical effect on the atoms they're attached to, such as the carbon right here, is an increase in the electrophilic nature of that atom. So for example, in this phosphorylated sugar, this carbon I've highlighted in blue is a great electrophile. Phosphorylation, the installation of this diphosphate group at that carbon, enables nucleophilic attack by an ammonia from glutamine in a substitution reaction. And this may not occur in a single step. It may involve the departure of the diphosphate first, followed by coordination of the ammonia to that positively charged carbon. But in any event, the important point is that the diphosphate portion here is acting as a leaving group. And by the way, this is commonly abbreviated in biochemical contexts using the abbreviation PPI. P sub I is used to represent phosphate, and PPI with two P's indicates two phosphoryl groups, or pyro or diphosphate. Installation of a phosphate or diphosphate group can also enable elimination reactions, such as decarboxylations, and that's what we see in this bottom example. The strategic positioning of a phosphate group here in this metabolic intermediate enables decarboxylation at a carbon beta to the phosphate group. And through electron flow like this, in which the phosphate group acts as a leaving group or nucleophage, we end up with a loss of carbon dioxide, CO2, which comes from this portion, and the loss of the phosphate anion. So here we see applications of organophosphates to substitution reactions in biochemical contexts. That's the first example where nitrogen is ultimately substituting for oxygen, and elimination reactions such as decarboxylations, which are used to establish double bonds within metabolic structures. Those applications are primarily chemical, but the phosphate group has important physical applications as well in biochemical systems. In essence, it can serve as a charged molecular tag, and this has important applications for molecular recognition. There are, for example, pockets within enzymes that can readily recognize the phosphate unit, and also for the containment of a molecule within the cell membrane. And let me explain what I mean by that last point about containment in a little more detail. So you may have learned before that the cell membrane is a lipid bilayer. It consists of phospholipids, which are charged on one end and hydrophobic on the other end. And the hydrophobic bits tend to find themselves in the middle of the membrane, and the hydrophilic charged bits tend to find themselves on the outside and inside. Many molecules can diffuse readily through the cell membrane, since it's rather fluid. And glucose, which is a neutral molecule, is one example of a molecule that can readily do this. It can come in and out of the cell membrane relatively easily. Glucose is a great energy source for the cell, and this is a problem. If it can diffuse out of the cell easily, it's hard for the cell to harness the energy in glucose, since entropy and just natural diffusion are going to encourage the glucose to leave the cell spontaneously. To avoid this, the first step of glycolysis is phosphorylation of glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate or G6P. G6P now has a net negative charge with its phosphate group. And because of that charge, glucose 6-phosphate is repelled by the anionic charged portion of the cell membrane. This allows the cell machinery to more easily harness the energy in glucose by keeping that molecule inside the cell. And just to give a little teaser, this is the first step of glycolysis, which we'll talk about a little later in the course. It's really this phosphorylation event that ensures that the cell is able to hold on to glucose so that it can further elaborate it and ultimately get energy out in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. One other thing that's worth mentioning is the nature of this reaction we're looking at right here. ATP, a triphosphate, is converted to a diphosphate, and a phosphoryl group is installed at a nucleophilic hydroxyl oxygen. This type of reaction in which a nucleophile picks up a phosphoryl group is referred to as phosphorylation, or less commonly, phosphoryl group transfer. In essence, phosphorylation is nothing more than a nucleophilic substitution process. The phosphoryl group is electrophilic at phosphorus, and in ATP, the remainder of the molecule acts like a massive leaving group. The ADP portion acts like a huge leaving group. And so in combination with a nucleophile, we can get what is essentially a nucleophilic substitution process in which a nucleophile displaces adenosine diphosphate like this 
to establish a new bond between the phosphor group and nucleophile. The PO bonds in phosphoesters and phosphoanhydrides can readily undergo hydrolysis reactions, which typically lead to phosphates or lower phosphoesters. So this, this example on the left shows an instance of RNA hydrolysis with a general acid and general base first assisting an intramolecular attack of a nucleophile at the phosphorus atom with departure of this oxygen as a leaving group, and then a general base assisting water in attacking the phosphorus and breaking a second PO bond. The ultimate result here you'll notice is the loss of half of the RNA strand, which has disappeared from the bottom as a leaving group, taking its hydroxyl group with it, and we're left with a phosphomonoester where we started with a diester. Why is this called a hydrolysis reaction? Well, it's a reaction in which water is acting as a nucleophile, and the key step really is right here. Water is engaging in nucleophilic substitution of a PO bond to establish a new phosphomonoester. The second example, shown on the right with just curved arrows, is the hydrolysis of ATP. This is again a hydrolysis reaction because water is acting as a nucleophile and ultimately displacing this PO bond. Here another water molecule is shown assisting as a general base, but the key idea is that water is encouraging the lysis or cleavage of the PO bond to form ultimately ADP, which is this portion of the molecule on the right with two phosphate groups and a phosphate anion. These reactions are often exothermic because the OPO linkages in anhydrides are relatively weak, and in phosphoesters, the PO linkages involving alkoxy groups tend to be relatively weak, weak relative to the phosphate anion anyway. And so it's often thermodynamically favorable for these phosphates to undergo hydrolysis. That said, there's actually a really important point to make about these reactions that we haven't touched on yet. Why does nature use phosphates if they readily undergo hydrolysis? The reason is these reactions are often kinetically slow. Hydrolysis of phosphates can be kinetically slow because of all these negative charges that we find in phosphoanhydrides and especially phosphomonoesters. The negative charges slow down the hydrolysis process since there's repulsion between the nucleophilic water and these anionic charges in the phosphor groups. This allows phosphates to exist for kind of an optimal period of time. They can be hydrolyzed in enzymatic active sites, for example, but hydrolysis of phosphates and phosphoanhydrides tend to, tends to be slow enough that they can persist in cellular conditions for long enough to be useful.